And we will share our screen. Good evening, everyone. Um, I appreciate you being here as always with us. And tonight we begin another series, another new series on, um, on our journey through Valencia at, at Westminster. My and Mr. Van Horn helped me set this up two and a half years ago, I guess now. Uh, my efforts to uh, volunteer and spend time with you guys and really appreciate the opportunity to be at we Westminster and just to participate with you and kind of go through things that I know you probably know and uh, at the same time maybe show you some insights or some things that um, that, that maybe you didn't know or, or had forgotten. The very first session we did, uh, you know, two years ago was on um, the American Revolution. And when we started that process, I explained kind of the background and a participant uh, who was there um, through Becca um, sent me a note saying that they appreciated so much the explanation of kind of what the founders were thinking as they were structuring um, uh, the, the material for what would become our country's government. And that they thought, this person thought that I had explained very well um, kind of the backdrop. And so I, I, I think that's a passion of mine, wanting to understand what the founders were thinking and to be clear, not to somehow assume that our founders were infallible. They were not. They were just humans like you and me um, or that everything that they thought of structurally um, is something that we should be doing today. I, I personally do not think that. Um, some people might, but I, I don't. Um, but but the, the challenge is in understanding the differences in the possible structures. So that's this session we're going to dive in and begin a process. We're going to spend three weeks. So I'll explain all that in a minute. So why would we want to do this series? So I thought it actually needed some backdrop to make sure that you understood kind of why I was wanting to spend three of our times together on this. And for me, um, it, it, it's that today, most people assume or believe that the two words, republic and democracy, are really synonyms, that they represent the exact same idea. Um, and prior to the 1900s, this was not the case. Uh, in our last series, when we were working on the, the changes in society, I was reading some of the speeches by some of the presidents, Grover Cleveland, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, um, looking at the writings of senators and representatives who were some of the leaders, uh, House of Representatives, you know, the, uh, the Speaker of the House. Prior to the 1900s, basically no one ever talked about the country being a democracy, a, a capital D democracy. They would always speak about the republic. Now they would, at times, speak about our democracy, small d, or kind of a pushing the, the value of democracy, meaning um, the, the elements of democratic ideas. But they would never talk about capital D democracy as a governing system. But then around 1910, and you can see this best in Theodore Roosevelt's speeches. If you read his speeches as the president from 01 to 08, and then you start reading things that he was writing in 08, 09, 10, 11, you can begin to see a change in his own verbiage where he would write about the Republic. And then later he starts talking about democracy, particularly after Wilson is elected and wins that, as we saw last time, controversial or explosive, it wasn't really controversial, but it's certainly very tense and, and, and kind of massively important 1912 election. And when you look at Wilson as president, which we did a little, but not in depth, because most of Wilson's presidency, as, as you know, is within foreign policy. So World War I really becomes Wilson's whole story. When you look at his writings, he is the, really the first president to start talking consistently about democracy, capital D. Um, he would talk about for his role or, or the role of the country in World War I as saving the world for democracy, capital D. 
And so Wilson's kind of this moment where you really start off. And then, of course, when you, you get to FDR, who's walking in that progressive mindset, he really is the one who links it in so that by the time you get to the end of the 20th century, few people ever talk about the Republic. You, you go back and read the speeches of the presidents in the 19th century, so the 1800s. It's always the Republic. You read, particularly post-World War II, or listen to the speeches of our presidents and, and political leaders, it's always the democracy. So how that happened, right? There's been a shift, obviously, in the verbiage. And I noticed it personally. Now, maybe it's because I was younger, right? So 20. 2000 election, I was 36, not 56 like I am now. Um, and as you remember the 2000 election, it was very close and Al Gore, Vice President Al Gore, won more popular votes than, um, than Governor George W. Bush. And the argument made and the frustration that came, and of course, as you guys, if you lived here, you knew Florida was in the center. I don't know what all is still gonna happen with this last election. Uh, although, you know, clearly, uh, I, I would say, clearly former Vice President Biden won the election. We'll, we'll see how this all plays out. I, I, it's, we're still in some interesting times, I guess I would say it that way. But I told my wife, I'm so glad it didn't involve us, didn't involve Florida for once, right? Um, and so when you look at this, the, the, I heard it from students, I heard it from friends. Why didn't Gore win? He got the most votes. And that assumption, that frustration emerged because people thought we live in a democracy. Because in a democracy, isn't it always the most votes wins, right? It's, it's the rule of the majority, right? And so this is the same argument Andrew Jackson made in 1824 to no avail. He was not made the president, but he did use it to kind of stoke the fire to his campaign victory in 1828. Right? In a republic, there is typically never a direct vote by the citizens. There can be indirect voting to set up representatives, but even that is not necessarily a process by which the city, there may be representatives, as we will see in a moment, a Senate or even an, an assembly, but it doesn't mean that it was voted on by the people, right? Um, and so you get this kind of core confusion, I think, surrounding our preamble. So we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, do the following, all the things, right? And so it was interesting when Madison and the gang wrote that phrase, one of the arguments that the anti-federalists made was kind of a, how dare you suggest that the people get to structure government? The people, the argument was made, do not get to structure government, the states do. And typically coming from anti-federalists, they were more Lockean than the Federalists. And so by being more Lockean, what I mean is for Locke, limited government. But so limited government in the minds of the founders, particularly the anti-Federalists, was not less power in the government, more power through democracy in the people. It was less power in the central government and a more dispersed power amongst smaller units who are closer to the people. We talked about that when we talked about the Constitution, which we may get back into in our third week. So I think part of the confusion coming out of this 2000 election, and I think it's still what riles people up today, is this erroneous belief that we live in a democracy. But to be fair, maybe it's only erroneous because of what we've all been taught about the two words, that the two words are somehow synonyms. Now, I will offer and try to show you in these next three weeks that the two words are related, and they're related because they both reflect a government of the people. So I'm going to try to explain that as we, we go along. And again, boy, this is one of the nights I really wish we could be in a room where you could stop and ask me questions, but kind of charging on through. So we're going to go way back in antiquity 
and then come up to the Romans and the Athenians, right? So just so you know where we're going over the three weeks, because again, it was kind of a, it's not a unique structure. I'm not just teaching on a thing like World War II or something, so you know how the plan would go. We're going to look and really examine what I just was saying in far more depth to try to understand where did this love affair, as I put it, of the word democracy come from in the 1800s? That'll be week three. That's three, two weeks from now, right? So the 17th. The next week, so next week, we're going to look at what the Athenians did. And they are, in my opinion, the only real democracy we've ever had. Many political scientists would disagree with that. And I'll tell you why they disagree. Either they argue the Athenians actually were not a democracy either, which is kind of weird, but some do argue that. Um, or it was an imperfect one because it didn't, in their opinion, let everybody vote who should have voted. So then, you know, that's a problem. But we're going to discuss it, right, and kind of look our way through what the Athenians did. And then uh, the latter part of, of next week, we'll kind of say what happened between, say, the fall of the Roman, well, the empire, for, but the republic, through, you know, kind of the Middle Ages up to the 1800s. I mean, obviously, there's more gaps there. But we're going to kind of just walk really quickly and see, like, what happened, because the Venetians will bring back the republic. So anyway, we'll do that in, in week two. And tonight, what did the Romans do? Now, chronologically, I should have done the Athenians before the Romans, but because we are a republic, I thought it was more important for us to spend time looking first at saying, well, what did the Romans do? Because that is what our founders were looking at. Now, they were all very well, well, not all of them, but many of them were very well skilled and educated in these um antiquity versions. They knew what the, the, the Dutch had done, who had a version of a republic. They certainly knew what England had done, because that all come from England. Um, they knew the Venetians in the Middle Ages, but they knew Rome and Athens. And so there's a real sense in all the verbiage that we use, House Representatives, um, Senate, that they're, they're aiming at the, if there's two paths or two trails, they're certainly aiming to be on the Roman side. They didn't mimic the Romans because they rejected some things the Romans did. So what did the Romans do? We're going to go. So now it's back all the way up to antiquity. So when you look at antiquity and you scan the globe, right, and you look at, and I mean antiquity, so let's just say the entire BC era, maybe even up to 500 AD, maybe 1000 AD, depending on where you want to look. Now, when I say antiquity, I don't mean anything AD, and I really mean Bronze Age to maybe 500. So, you know, anyway, when you look way back, right, one basic concept emerges about how governance happened. And this is really important to settle as a foundation what's the metric, right? Because everything else, I think, has to be kind of understood and compared to this historical norm. This is the norm. This is not the aberration. What we're going to look at, the Romans, the Athenians, and what we've done is the aberration. And quite honestly, I think if you really want to understand things like the rise of fascism, things like the appeal to the strong man, um, desiring for someone to come and save us, all that is reflective of how what we say we want on paper, a government of the people, is actually the opposite of what our species normally gravitates towards. So you'll see people say, oh, you're on the wrong side of history, or, or the, the move of history is to this way. I dispute that fully, and, and, and probably because I'm more Hobbesian than I am Lockean, and I think Lo uh, Hobbes had a better grasp of the species than Locke did, but that's a whole different conversation. So I call this the power pyramid. When I'm teaching my students in antiquity, because we talk about this, obviously, in my, in my ancient history class, and what I mean by the power pyramid is this is that when you look across the tribes, what you see, every continent, every people group, every race, is that wherever there was a civic structure, we'll use that phrase to mean a general understanding of, of I'm with these people in this certain geographical locale, and I'm under the rule with these people. If somebody's in charge. And some of these in antiquity could be quite large, like the Egyptians, but most were quite small. And so again, tribal, most relationships in antiquity 
uh, governing wise, we're you know familial, right? We're all related in some way, right? And so you have a central power at the top, and then you have everybody else. And occasionally, you did have a middle class who were probably related to the top. So it's sort of like a chieftain, and then the chieftain has two or three brothers, or the chieftain has you know five or six children, and so they're all related. So there is this kind of I'm not part of the masses, but I'm not the person in charge. And it is always a single power. Now, I use the term central control because there are a few occasions where you can point to the power pyramid being designed in a way that is, um, you know, a small group. But usually it's a single. And as I tell my students, it's one of these four types always the rich man, the strong man the holy man or the wise man. And sorry, ladies, um, love you both. Or uh, they're, out, they're out there. It was never a woman. I mean, I know we like the Amazon story. We, know, we like Wonder Woman, but it was never a woman. There are matriarchal societies that we can find. The Iroquois were a good example of that. But when you look at antiquity, it, it, either a woman was the anomaly, which is it's fine. I, mean, I, I hope we elect a woman in my lifetime as a president. And regardless of how I feel about the outcome of the election, I do think it's a good thing that we finally elected a woman to vice president. We've had three or four moments before, uh, Miss Ferraro, as you remember, and others. And so, you know, I think it's, um, it's good. I would love to have a woman. But historically, in antiquity, didn't happen. So when I use man, I am being am, am thinking in terms of, 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 of the sexes. Now, now, sometimes there's a combination, right? So it's the rich man with the strong man. So kind of the strong man is the muscle behind my control. Um, more often, it's the rich man and the holy man. So I have the power and the money, but I want the, the holy person to help me win the support of the people. And occasionally, it's the wise man with the rich man. Sometimes it's a strong man with the holy man. So I've gained, you know, I'm in charge because I'm stronger than everybody. I've killed everybody else. You know, I, I can kill everybody else. Everybody realizes I'm the best warrior. So they put me in charge, that kind of a thing. That's what I mean, a strong man. Um, and then he will have the holy man with him or the wise man. It is rare, you can find it, but it is rare in antiquity that the wise man or the holy man is on top alone. Um, it, they're almost always there in a pairing, but there are a few moments where we could say, oh, this person was in charge of the tribe or the people, and he wasn't the richest necessarily, and he wasn't the strongest, but he was considered wise, and in the wisdom, was able to maintain control for some time. When you see the wise men in particular, it's a one-off, so they're also usually something of an aberration. So this system is the system of the ancient world. And the main point is that centralized power is in the hands of this small group, again, usually in a family or a few people who had the access to power. Noted that there are times when there's an advisory council um, and noted that in antiquity, there are times when the person at the top gets, gets killed in a, in a takeover, right? Again, usually by a strong man or a rich man who's able to make it happen. And they take over. Um, and that sometimes comes from the advisory council. Um, but the, the, the bigger piece is, again, if we're saying our system or the system that we're looking at are connected to understanding the of the people concept, that does not exist in antiquity. There's no people or grouping that I personally am aware of. So there, there could be some I'm just not aware of where you have this kind of of the people world view right? That doesn't mean that there weren't leaders at the top of the power pyramid who weren't nice. It doesn't mean that there weren't places within certain geographic or civic entities that certain leaders did not incorporate maybe more of the people in, in the system um, in, in various and sundry bureaucratic administrative roles. They, they did. That doesn't mean when we say power pyramid that we should think in terms of modern dictatorship. So we always associate, rightfully so, I think, dictatorship with evil, right? Not only with evil, but with harm done to other humans, right? So human rights abuses that we kind of think of that. We think of Stalin, think of Mao, um, think of Pol Pot, we think of Castro, 
And we think, oh, there's not only the person at the top having control, that's normal, but they have this evil connected to them. So there were some maybe evil people that you can find through history of various tribes and leaders. And of course, you know, there are thousands, right, of, of leaders and groupings, most of which we never talk about in history classes because they were very, very small. But when you look at them, you get the same pattern over and over and over again. In no place, in no continent, in no racial group, was there anything of a, haunt, a hint of government of the people. And then around the 600s, on two spots in the Mediterranean, something weird happened something different emerged. And they have a story behind them. And so we're gonna talk our way through those. Um, the Athenians are first, as I said earlier, kind of chronologically. Their system begins to emerge in dispute and dissension around the 620s and will largely firm up in the first decade of the 500s. At that exact same time, to their west, on the other peninsula in the Mediterranean, another city-state also emerges with a new idea, both in a very strange and, again, aberrational way, will put the power into the citizens. The citizens will take a various levels of control or have large influence and input into the governing decisions. So you get to this place where all of a sudden you say, wow, this is a government of the people. Okay, and, and again, if we could point to a variety of other places prior to this, then we might say that there is this other strand within the species in which this is normal. But you just, I mean, again, I'm willing for somebody to correct me. Um, I have studied it and tried to really look into it. I think I've told you guys before, we will ask like, what's your field or what do you study? And I'm just talking to somebody outside of academia. I just say, well, I like to study and serve myself something of a scholar of how societies morph and change over time. And because I teach survey classes, I get the privilege of kind of flying, you know, in a jet over the chronological stream of world history from 3500 BC when it all starts roughly to now, again and again and again and again, right? So I, I feel comfortable with the layout of the land, not the expert that can be closest on the ground. So anyway, okay, so let's look at Rome because that's the place you wanna kind of focus on the Italian peninsula because that's where we were. So, the best we understand is roughly around the 800s, a group of people arrive in the north of the peninsula. About 50 years later, there is evidence of the people group we call the Romans around this city on the Tiber River. If you ever look to the geography, we're not really doing a history of Rome right now, but if you ever look to the geography, you can see why they ended up there. In fact, one of the things I have my students do is we kind of talk our way through you know, what is a civilization and what is necessary for a kind of um, a geographical civic entity to emerge. And almost always it's near water. So by being on the Tiber River, but then also almost always the successful ones are in something of a defensible location. There's something about the location that's beneficial. And if you've ever had the privilege of being a Rome, although it's hard to see today in modern times, but it's the, the center of the city is set in the midst of, I believe it's seven, maybe it's five mountains around or hills at least. So from a defensive point of view, you can imagine being in that location and you could put forts or watches on the mountains and basically see any enemy coming at you. So it was a very good place to be. Of course, the history of Rome goes back through the fall of the Trojan, uh, the, the city of Troy, and the whole Iliad um, and the Aeneid and the Odyssey, the Aeneid from Rome, the Latin point of view, Rome's point of view, Iliad Odyssey from the Greek point of view, they kind of all merge in there. Um, there's no evidence at this point for us to really be confident to say, oh, this is exactly what happened. So, you know, there's the mythology behind Romulus and Remus, the two children raised by a she-wolf, and there's a picture here of, of, you see this all over, particularly the ancient city, 
of Rome of, that they that they valued this right that there was a a sense of a, of a, a masculinity to some degree but sort of a, a character trait of how the Romans saw themselves you know we can survive we have this kind of rugged animalistic kind of approach right to life right um, and so whether there was the there certainly probably was not a she wolf I'll just say it that way um, there is the idea that the Romans in the city, city-state, begin um, structuring themselves in a monarchical kind of way. Now again, they're tribal, there were three tribes that basically form together, that emerge, and they, they end up being sort of led by what eventually would be called a king. I'm not convinced the Romans called it a king, but it certainly became familiar for, uh, for historians looking from the Middle Ages, the time of the Renaissance, when there were kings, to look back and apply it that way. And there are seven kings on their journey to this new structure. Um, in this system, the, the person at the top held imperium. Now you can see from that word, we get where we get the word imperial, and we get the word empire. And this is where when Octavian does what he does in the last decade or so of the BC era, um, is really why we begin to call that the Roman Empire. And it's from the fact that, that this one man, Octavian, once again, pulls all the Imperium to himself, which is you're seeing a moment changes in this one moment, it's one brief time, right? So the leader has Imperium, he can make all the decisions, his full you know, authority. So judicial, executive, legislative, military, it all falls into him, like we would imagine a king would do, right, at the top of the power pyramid. So again, a very familiar kind of same story, the power pyramid kind of thing. There was a senate, but the senate was advisory only, right? It had equal representation from the three tribes. And the king basically could act independently, but knew that he needed to involve these leaders. So this is kind of that rich middle group of the power pyramid that I showed you earlier. Um, but again, the kings, there are seven, uh, the, the Roman kings, they, they could um, choose what to bring before the Senate. So they didn't have to bring everything before the Senate. So again, it was in no way legislative. I don't, don't think in those terms. It was just an advisory group, but a large one, 300, right? And they're trying to include a lot of different people. Um, almost all the senators were from family legacy, so you can have a bloodline kind of thing. It wasn't like there was elections within the tribes. The king could choose who he wanted to do. Well, fast forward, well, okay, sorry, saying there, this is an important understanding of Rome to understand how the, they saw the family as central. Now, this actually, I might could have left this slide, slide off, but, but, but this is a, a core part to understanding antiquity, that the family, father, mother, children, is typically, I would say exclusively, um, the structure. Uh, again, we, some people may like the kind of the Amazon myth, the mythology of this race of only women on this island, and they just sort of existed together. Um, but that's not got any grounding in what real history was uh, in antiquity, right? And in the, the, the Roman story, if you were a woman and you wanted to live in antiquity, Rome would have been one of the best places you possibly could have gone, Rome or, or Sparta. Um, and in Rome, the father basically mimicked the king and the mother mimicked kind of what we would call a prime minister. She basically ran the system or he was the CEO and she was the CFO. She kind of ran everything in the system. They had slavery, the di divorce was rare. There was an important concept that kind of gets, if you want to really get deep into the Roman kind of ethos and understand a part of where feudalism comes from, clientage was a system in which they had structured the concept of there being a patron and a client. So it's sort of like today we might um, have a young person move into a new business, get hired by a law firm or get hired by a business and be given an older mentor or be urged to go join, you know, the Rotary uh, or the Elks, and basically get under the the the, uh, the uh, not authority, but the influence of a powerful leader uh, within those groups who can kind of help this young executive, this young business person, kind of make their way. That was the story that went on there. 
Um, and it was helpful in kind of fostering this kind of upper crust of Rome. Now, again, there's a whole other story about understanding Rome relative to um, social impl implications, lack of equity between this kind of upper crust and everybody else on the bottom. So we're not touching that. And by the way, we're not saying in either Athens or Rome that the emergence of this new system of government in some way um, was great for human rights. Right, that oh, when the, we lived there, there was no ill, there was no inequity, there was no injustice. Not true. Both places were, again, because humans are involved, is what I would say, had its own corruptions and issues as you go along. All right. So, what led to a change was when you got to the latter part, uh, so the 520s, 530s. The choice of kings began to become problematic. Now, the first five, I believe, were chosen or at least accepted by the Senate. So remember, the Senate are basically the rich leaders of the three major tribes. So it's not, you, you read on some websites, there was an election. I, I think that's really pressing it to suggest that the kings of Rome were elected, because that's, 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 this rich upper crust kind of worked to figure out who would be the person, right? So there was maybe some politic political action happening, but it's not like there was an election, right? Okay, it's who you will vote for. And by the time you get to this last two or three, you start seeing the emergence of family lineage, right? So, so I'm the king and my son's going to be the person. So you're starting to see what we will see deeply in Europe in the Middle Ages. Well, as you may know, there's a very famous story of the son of the current king rapes the wife of a governor, which is horrible and tragic. She goes to her father, right, who is a chief magistrate in Rome. The story is she goes before the Senate. I'm not so sure that necessarily happened. Um, but she goes, she tells what happened like two days ago. And then to avoid any what she perceived to be judgment against her, she commits suicide. And if you read the ancient law codes, there's often a very unfair structuring for how women are viewed and treated and judged when something like rape happens. Maybe not unlike we have some in our own current day, right? Where you kind of get the victim gets blamed um, based on how she dressed or how some things she did, right? So there, maybe there's an old legacy that we still deal with. I'd like to think it's less today than then. Anyway, um, Lucretia kills herself. And the, 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 the killing of herself was the more shocking thing to many of the people in the sense So they, they weren't roused to overthrow the king because his son raped somebody, which is probably telling about maybe how often this happened or the abuses of power. But when she kills herself, then they're roused up. And the leader is Lucius Junius, Junius Brutus, you can see there. And he was a grandson of the fifth king. Now, the seventh king's also related to the fifth king. So there's, there's family issues there. If you know your Julius Caesar story, you know Brutus is a very famous name. And there's a connection there. And anyway, he gets up in front of the Senate makes a speech saying we need to overthrow the monarchy, which is kind of surprising coming from him, but he's the best person to make the speech. And they do. And what they do to set up is they set up what they called a government of the people involving the public's things. So in fact, I think it's on this slide. Let me just double check. Um, yeah, at the bottom, see this right here? The idea of republic is this merging of two words. I mean, show you, I'm gonna come back, I promise. But look at the top, the, the next slide here at the top. Um, what, maybe I don't have, um, I thought I did. Oh, there it is. See the top of this slide here? Sorry, I'll go back, my bad. Res publica, the people's things. What those two words together back up here, the public affair, see, oh, my bad. The public affair or things, that's the res word, publica, publica, are the people. So it's kind of putting them together, the public affair or the things pertaining to the people. So Brutus says, 
We need to basically become a, a governing system that does not have a single leader at the top. And in fact, we need to eliminate the power pyramid or at least broaden it, right? To bring in more voices. And what he meant and what he wanted to do and what he sold everybody on was putting the Senate in charge. So now for you and me, we might say of a city of 10,000 people, governance by 300 is in no way um, a, a government of the people, okay? But when you look initially where we are and you say all of our governments at this point are single leaders or at best maybe a small council of two to four or five people and the Romans come along and say, we're gonna have a group that has some, some sort of connection to the people and we're going to put the Senate in charge. This is quite shocking. They go even further by choosing to construct a system that would not have one person on the top, but have two people of equal power who had the ability to stop the other with the words you already know, the veto, which is Latin for I forbid. So it's kind of a shocking structure, but then they go further Brutus realizes we need everyone in on this. So the people, the, the plebeian class, um, with the poor class, the, the, the majority class, the 95 or probably more like 80% of the city group, were summoned to the forum. And this is the forum here. And so they're summoned into the forum. And Brutus makes a speech, basically laying out, here's what's happened. Here's what we want to do. We, the Senate, want to do this. We want to do this with you. We want everybody involved in this. And he appeals to them to vote, and they do vote. And there is a public support for the elimination of the monarchy. Now, the monarch, the guy gets away. He doesn't get killed or anything. He just leaves. But at that moment, 509 BC, the Roman structure this thing they call the Republic. Now, how did they structure it? What, what did they do? And maybe another way to look at this is we need to ask ourselves, did they go to a place where all the people got to vote? Because if we're going to argue in 2020 that Republic and democracy are the same thing, then we would have to imagine that the Romans ultimately got to a place where all the people voted on things. So that's our question. We're going to try to figure this out, you and me. Right, here we go. There's the form. So one of the things the seventh king had done is he had stripped some Senate members of their seats and cast them out. So Brutus and his colleague, the other consul, they bring back 300. They move away the religious function of the king off to the side. This is really unique. It's a whole different conversation you know our valuing in our time of separation of church and state, which actually is a Christian concept, which goes back to the Middle Ages when you would have had in the power pyramid, one person saying, this is the religion for everybody, like it, don't like it, this is the deal. Well, that was antiquity also. There was never a separation of church and state in Persia or Egypt or Babylon or Syria uh, or Israel. I mean, every place, church and state together, right? And in Rome, that was the, the place. The, the, in fact, when you look at the, the time of the seven kings, the greater check on their power was whether the gods were with us or not, not what the Senate thought. So the king had this role. Well, they decide in creating the, the Republic that they will separate that role from the elected leaders of the two consuls and move it over to this rex sacrorum, right? It becomes like this religious leader, maybe similar to the Pope, but let's not draw too close of a line there. The two consuls were elected. So now this is an, an interesting point here. There was an election amongst the three tribes for the consuls. Now the Senate largely controlled this. And the two consuls would be advised by the Senate and when they were over they went back to the Senate. So imagine right now our Congress having Jimmy Carter and, and, and George W. Bush and Bill Clinton sitting in Congress. 
Um, that's what the Romans did. So you'd serve your year and then you'd go back. Sometimes they were senators who got elected and then went back. Sometimes they were not senators and they were elected in and then became senators. One year only. So boy, think of the chaos we've had with our elections. They're doing one a year, right? This, the consuls had the power of imperium, but not the same imperium because again, we've already said the religious structure is taken away. And now the Senate actually takes an equal role. It's not really fair to say the Senate dominated the consuls because again, the consuls had imperium, but now it's very clear they have to work with the Senate. They couldn't just arbitrarily choose to pick and what they wanted to bring before the Senate. The Senate kind of ran the governing structure alongside the consuls. And by being elected once a year, you can see how the consuls typically actually had less power than the Senate. The Senate would have kind of longitudinal history and thus influence where the consuls were kind of coming in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. All right. So what is going to happen, though, over this time is much like we've done, they finish basically saying, OK, look, here's the structure. Right. But it's not perfect. And so there will be over about 300 years um, a movement of reforms, of kind of structuring different things. Um, so, for instance, uh, very early, they recognized having two leaders in a time of war was problematic. So they created kind of an emergency position that in a time of crisis, typically war, um, they would have this person and they call this person the dictator. Now we have to make sure we don't get our modern dictator and dictatorship confused here. They're linked because the dictator had all the power, all the imperium, and typically if it was a major crisis, the Senate wasn't even working anymore. So the Senate would often be off at war. Most of the senators, particularly if they were young enough, and I mean 40 and under, maybe 50 and under, they were off fighting too. Um, so the Senate basically didn't function and the dictator was in control, although the dictator often was a general marching off to war with the army, so not sitting at home. But we didn't want to have a situation in war where there were the two leaders and they might disagree with each other and, and count, count, um, veto each other, um, kind of cancel each other out. They want to go down that road. Um, 150 years later, as they began to expand all up the peninsula and then eventually up to the north, so kind of south of the Alps, near the Adriatic, on the side with Sardinia and Corsica, it just gets too far away. And they recognize for there to be effective governance, there needs to be a person in charge so they construct the idea of the proconsul, which sounds like you know, the consuls, the amateurs. I don't know what I mean. Pro meaning of or for the consul, right? So the proconsul becomes kind of the um, agent acting for the government. Now they'll eventually construct two or three other titles. And so if you look at their empire days, you can see different regions and places that had different people in charge who were all reflecting back to, to Rome in some level, some capacity, right? Pontius Pilate is an example that he wasn't a proconsul. Um, I think he was a praetor perhaps, but in any case, you know, he was the man in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' birth, where he's kind of, I mean, at the time of Jesus' death, where he's kind of responsible because he's answering for the consul. It's interesting when you look at that because what you can see is the Romans are, are going to struggle, and this is why the Republic falls apart, I would offer, um, to, to ex be able to expand their system, right? Because in other words, if it's in a government of the people in Rome, and now you have Roman citizens, say, at the north of Rome or over near Venice or down near Sicily, they're far too far away to make it to the back, to Rome, the city, right? And so in, in, you give them a proconsul. Well, they, he basically has dictatorial control, so now we're back to the power pyramid. It's kind of an interesting juxtaposition, and I think it shows us how the Romans never thought too deeply in terms of um, constitutional reform, we might say. All right, so let's keep going. Over the centuries, they do begin to emerge assembly groups. 
Now there's different ones. The first one there had been around from the beginning. It was sort of in context with the Senate, but it never really had the authority that the Senate did. So the curata, I mean, it's important, obviously. The one that I want you to really focus on is the last one, the tributa, right? Um, this one is the one that is the most important to emerge in the latter part of this development of their government. But do notice that when you look at these four councils or assembly groups, there's no voting by individuals. All votings were by whatever the unit was. That, and there were different units for the different assemblies. They were structured different ways. One came out of the military. So all the soldiers, all the veterans basically formed their own kind of governing council. And so there'd be different ways of measuring things from, from their units, right? But in any case, there, there was never like one person, one vote kind of thing, right? And there was never a structure that appealed itself to all the citizens voting. Now, if you look at the last two again, the concilium plebis and the comedia uh, tribu tributa, uh, the tributa, um, both of those two are coming from that lower group on the bottom of the power pyramid of the plebeians. And it was open to people who were not the rich upper crust patricians, right? But again, it's not everybody's invited. So it's an important consideration. The development, though, of the, the assembly, as we end up, it's easier to call it the assembly, right, is the emergence of the end of this 200-year working of what we, as historians call, what well, the Romans called it this too, the struggle of the orders, patrician, plebeian, right? So those, those two groups. And not surprisingly, and this is, again, why we look at this and why our founders were like, hey, this is a good system. We should try this. Um, there's a reality that the plebeians initially don't have a voice, and they want a larger and larger and larger voice so that they do eventually form their own assembly and over the next 200 years will pull more power to the assembly. Now, they never pull all the power from the Senate or the consuls. But you'll get to the point, as you see there in 287, where the assembly will gain the power of veto over the Senate, so thus over the, over the, the consuls. The tribune also sort of stands as a counter to the consuls. It's, now, it's very complex. I want to show you a graph uh, our friend Josh Robinson, who taught us a year or so ago, showed us this graph the first time. So there's a lot to look at here. I'm not, you know, it's way too small of a text for us to read and really get our head wrapped around. Feel free to pause the video if you're watching some video to, to see it and really go deep into it. I mean, you can look at the column on the right that says executive magistrates, and you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And Matt, I mean, that's 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 re that's crazy, right? I mean, we have a president. That's it. Um, the governors are the executive magistrate of our states, but they're not in any way in a column with our president. Our president is singular, right? Even the vice president shouldn't be in a column like this. So you can see the Romans are kind of adopting different things. And this, by the way, is kind of why the Republic falls apart, in my opinion. Um, when you get to the, the crisis of the Punic Wars, which emerges right about this time. Um, so at the same time, the struggle of orders is going on. The Romans are effectively conquering the Italian peninsula. And so, ta-da! But then that will run them into the superpower of the um, Western Mediterranean, um, Carthage. And eventually, they'll go at it for a long process that we call the Punic Wars. Punic is the Latin for Phoenicia, and Carthage is a city colony of the old Phoenicians on the eastern part of the Mediterranean. Sorry if that's confusing. So when that war ends, the Republic begins a century of chaos that ultimately ends with Octavian destroying the Republic and instituting the empire. Part of why that happens, it's got nothing to do with Octavian or Caesar or Sola, but it has everything to do with the fact that the Constitution looked like this on this slide very complex, perhaps probably overly complex, and they never took the time to clean it up. 
to say, okay, hang on a second. We've expanded. We're far too big. How do we fix it? But, it, but back to the point we were talking about, the, the struggle of orders and the assembly and the tribune, the tribune became this person who could sort of protect the people. Well, protect them from whom? Well, the Senate and the consuls. So you can see kind of this dual wing of, of um, the system that Rome has. Patricians in the Senate, plebeians in the assembly, two executives, the consuls on one side, the tribune on the other. They kind of work together, they work apart, they're at each other, there's political structure, there's all kinds of it things in the mix there. And that's, that's their system that they build. Eventually, if you see any Roman artifacts, you'll see these four letters on everything. It's the Roman legions carried in their big, huge spear that they had. Now, the top of it is SPQR, right? The, the Roman Senate and the people, or the Senate and the people of Rome. And the idea that the Romans developed, certainly by the 300s, was that everything that we did was not done by a powerful man at the top of a power pyramid, but was being done by all of us collectively, all the citizens of Rome. But did the people ever have a say? That's the key question, because back to our larger topic. And the answer is no. The average citizen had no direct influence. They could attend the assembly and have some voting there. But even that was not a anybody can come all the time and vote when they wish. And clearly, as the city expanded its power and control over the peninsula, even just beyond the mountains near the Tiber, the average person would not have had the capacity to make the 15 or 20 mile journey, let alone the 300 or 700 mile journey to get to Rome to participate in some kind of decisions by the assembly. The Senate will always retain imperium until such time as the Republic falls. And so we can see here that there wasn't really a moment where the Republic was designed to be something that allowed the bulk of the citizens direct influence. It allowed the bulk of the citizens indirect influence. So the system was clearly structured in the Republic to have chosen people, either by election or in their term, at, at that time for Rome, for some hereditary um, selection, right? into these four, eventually four different assemblies that had a voice in the decision making. Again, we're not trying to say Rome did a bad job or Rome should have failed or they kind of ripped people off. We're not saying that at all. What we are saying is that it's not what we're going to see next week. One last piece and then we'll stop here. But, and I should add a slide for this. The whole structure is set upon the idea of citizenship and a citizen being involved or having, not involved, a citizen having investment. To be a citizen of Rome became one of the highest values. If you know your Bible stories from the New Testament, you get this when the, when the Christian leader Paul, who used to be called Saul, was arrested. And he was in a place in Greece, in the Greek peninsula, and he's going to be punished publicly, which is a way the Romans could try to enforce the law. And he's in the process of being beaten when he turns to the guy beating him. I don't, I don't know if he waited till a few strokes had landed just for the effect or what. And he says, is this how you treat a Roman citizen? Well, the jailer freaks out because you couldn't beat a Roman citizen. You could be somebody who lived in Rome. You could be somebody who was born in the Roman Empire or Republic, but you couldn't be a Roman citizen. And then there's this back and forth where somebody, I don't think it's the guy beating him, I think it's the next guy up, says, hey, well, I bought my citizenship. And Paul's like, no, no, I was born. And the guy freaks, he's like, oh my gosh, what have we done? Because we can't do that, right? So the citizen was an exclusive group of people who demonstrated their investment. Now for Rome, one of the principal ways you did that was by serving in the army. And that's a whole different conversation. So we'll just stop right there on that point. But I wanna make sure to emphasize, it wasn't, when we say of the people, people here, every living human, 
And that's not what they meant. And we'll see next week. That's not what the Athenians meant. Now, you and I don't have to agree with that. I'm just saying we have to understand that's not what they meant. What they meant was when they, when they said this right here, right, the Roman Senate and people, they really were meaning the Roman citizen, Senate and the citizens of Rome. Who are those citizens? Well, these certain people to whom citizenship has been conferred and who have invested in the success of what we're doing. And that's an important distinction. All right, so we'll stop there. Again, gosh, I wish we could be in person so you could ask me questions, but I'm always available. If you guys want to ever use the chat feature, you know you can. Um, I can answer it on the fly. Or if you want to email me, you can get with Becca, or I think all of you have my email. Certainly willing to. Next week, we'll look then at what the Athenians did because it is vastly different from what the Romans did. And we'll see some overlap, but we'll see these big differences. All right? I appreciate you guys being here. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, and I will talk to you soon.